This is one of the first iPods made by Apple and brought into the world by this guy. I'm going to explore some of this iPod's inner workings, do some firmware modding, and in that process, play some Doom and see how well it runs on here. I also made a YouTube short with iPod Doom. See the link below for that. So let's have a look at what makes this old iPod click. When I saw this recently, I was struck by how thick this looks compared to today's slim devices. It's heavy and solid, and it feels good to hold in the hand. Steve Jobs knew this feeling as well. I'm amused by this story of an early iPod prototype. Jobs played with the device, scrutinized it, weighed it in his hands, and promptly rejected it. It was too big. The engineers explained they had to reinvent inventing to create the iPod, and that it was simply impossible to make it any smaller. Jobs was quiet for a moment. Finally, he stood up, walked over to an aquarium, and dropped the iPod in the tank. After it touched the bottom, bubbles floated to the top. Those are air bubbles, he snapped. That means there's space in there. Make it smaller. Yeah, he was a jerk, but maybe he did some good things as well. This iPod has been lent to me by a friend. I didn't get any headphones or even a charger with this. The iPod's original headphones were white in colour, quite unusual for the time. A brilliant marketing ploy that acted like advertising by letting people know that you had an iPod. That led to a spate of people being rolled for their iPods in the early days. In response, I'm going to use these Sonys. If they can plug into a headphone socket, they'll work just fine. But not having a charger is a more difficult challenge. They have become quite rare because this iPod does not have a dedicated charging port or even a USB port. It uses FireWire to connect to computers, and this connection is also how iPod charges. Luckily, I do have this FireWire connector that I've saved in my parts box. I've been able to use it to build this dodgy cable and connect it up to 12 volts. I have to make really sure that it's wired correctly. 12 volts on the wrong pins will cause damage. So I double checked it. I even triple checked it before the first try. When I came to plug it in, it worked first go and I'm quite relieved to finally see this iPod turning on. This is probably the first time in getting close to almost 20 years that this has been powered up. This iPod is a second revision that uses a capacitive touch wheel instead of the original wheel that had to be physically rotated. The only other change in this second revision of iPod is that it was available in capacities up to 20 gigabytes. You can tell the difference between the first and second revisions. This version has a lot more metal around the top connectors compared to the first revision. Otherwise, the firmware and functions are exactly the same. There's a really nice backlight for the screen, which also makes it much easier to film. I'll be taking advantage of this in a lot of shots. Though, the battery is almost worn out, barely able to last 30 minutes. And with the backlight on, I'll be lucky to get 5 minutes. I'll be plugging this into charge often. This has a simple but functional menu, with a well-designed interface, in a very Apple-like style. There's even a game included, a simple version of Breakout, and it sucks. It's just not much fun, and there's no gap between the top of the bricks and the top of the screen for getting a nice bounce going to give you that payoff. I think this would have worked better as a hidden game in the firmware, with a secret code to access it just for its novelty value. Now there's something interesting to note about this particular iPod in the About menu. There's 2.6 gigabytes free out of about 18 or so, and yet zero songs. The original owner has told me how useful this became as a pocket storage device. And this was not actually that uncommon in the early iPod days, with one story about how scenes from the Lord of the Rings films were transported during production using iPods. There's even a story about how the production's IT manager was chased by thieves as he was transporting one of these precious iPods to Peter Jackson. The very high capacity for its size at the time was thanks to the tiny hard drive inside. This small size drive was developed by Toshiba, but at the time they didn't have a use case in mind. 
This is when hardware engineers working at Apple saw this drive. They realised how a good music player could be made with this drive at its heart. This hard drive that I have here is faulty though. I've tested it and it gives me a lot of errors and often just stops responding. But this is a good thing because I also love taking hard drives apart, giving me an opportunity to look inside. I'll start by first taking this label panel off so I can see the control board. There's a couple more screws and the control board comes right off. This is interesting to see, but I want to get right into the mechanical part of the drive. I'm going to put the control board back on so I can power it up after I've opened it up. Turning it over, I'm now going to split this other section of the drive open. This feels much more like I'm breaking open a seal, and there it is. We can see this drive has two platters inside, and the actuator arm looks like it has a total of four heads on it. I have taken similar small sized hard drives apart before, but that was a long time ago. It's really awesome to see inside one of these again and see it running. This is how Apple did it. This was the key to putting a thousand songs in your pocket over 20 years ago. It's time to plug this iPod into a computer and get some things loaded onto it. With only a Firewire port, this is going to be challenging, but I do have this nice vintage Sony Veo with an iLink port, normally used for connecting to camcorders. This port does use the Firewire protocol, but just with a different name and it uses a different connector. However, connecting an iPod is proving to be a bit of a challenge. I have a Sony iLink cable for connecting to camcorders, and I also have this adapter that converts from Sony's 4-pin iLink connector to Apple's 6-pin Firewire. But when I tried it, I was getting no connection. I tried everything I could think of, but it just wasn't working. So I ended up buying this dedicated 4-pin to 6-pin cable. I don't know what the difference is, but on first try, it works. Windows XP is now happily detecting an iPod. I've got iTunes running, and it's also able to see this iPod. I can now begin syncing some music. The Sony 4-pin iLink connectors don't provide any power, and so this iPod won't be able to recharge during the transfer. With limited battery power available, I'm hoping this will work. But the transfer completed without problems, and I've now got some music on here. I can now party like it's the early 2000s. With everything working on the hardware side, it's now time to do some firmware modding. I'm now going to install Rockbox. This is a free open source replacement firmware for music players. This is my first time trying it out, and from what I've seen online, it looks really good. But here comes my first problem. The Rockbox installer no longer runs on Windows XP, which is fair enough. Rockbox is still in development, so supporting older operating systems is just not a priority. But this does leave me with a bit of a challenge with using period hardware and older OSs. Fortunately, there is a way to install Rockbox manually by downloading the specific version for this iPod and then transferring it over using simple file copy. To get it working, I then have to run a command line program called iPod Patcher. This modifies Apple's firmware bootloader to instead boot Rockbox. But I've got another problem. This didn't work. iPod Patcher is detecting this iPod, but then it just halts without installing the bootloader. I didn't get an error, it just doesn't give me the option to install anything. At this point, I'll take advantage of one of iPod Patcher's other functions of backing up the current firmware. This does seem to be working, and it's a good idea when messing about like this. Almost all of iPod's firmware is stored on the hard drive. iPod does have a flash-based bootloader, but the only thing it contains is an emergency disk mode and a service mode for doing various hardware tests. I did run some tests to make sure everything was okay, and it does look like the hardware is all good. But if I can't find another way to modify the bootloader's startup sequence, then I'm in trouble. And it doesn't help that the Rockbox device status page now reads serious issues for the iPod 1G and 2G. 
but the note says that there's a problem with the click wheel on the first version of iPod. And this being the second version with the capacitive touch wheel, I think it should still be okay. Okay, next I'll try using an old version of the Rockbox installer. 1.4.0 seems to be the last version to run OK on Windows XP. But while it does seem to detect this iPod, it also won't install anything. I had to take a break at this point. Working with old hardware like this can be fun, but also frustrating at times. I eventually found an old version of iPod Patcher. Could it be this simple? Well, running this version now gives me the option to install the Rockbox bootloader. It's looking good and I think this is going to work. Rebooting the iPod and yes, Rockbox is now starting up. This is the latest version of Rockbox from 2019, finally running on this very old iPod. It looks amazing. There are so many options and settings in Rockbox. Just about every aspect of the experience can be customized. There's just so much you can do with this and so many options. There are even different themes that can be applied to the user interface with custom fonts and graphics. Almost all are user generated and shared on the excellent Rockbox forums. I really enjoy seeing these sort of old school forums still with an active community. Rockbox is also available to install on many different brands and models of music players. I can't believe I haven't tried this before. There's even a debug menu for having a look at all the low level functions and possibly messing up your custom firmware install and crashing the whole system like a pro. I'd love to show you all the names in the credits, but with over 700 contributors to Rockbox, this would take a while. Thank you to everyone who made this possible. Rockbox also includes a whole host of additional plugins, including demos. Some are interactive, giving you the ability to do many things you can't normally do on a music player, including such things as a Mandelbrot generator, making the experience more like having a mini computer than a music player. And of course, there are games. This copy of Brickmania, for example, puts Apple's attempt at a brick game to shame. I mean, these first iPods had Apple firmware updates for over four years, and yet they never updated their crappy brick game in that time. There are many games on here. Some are better than others. So let's try pushing this hardware and try Doom. And sure enough, there's a good port of the game and it runs really well. It's fast and responsive. It's amazing that a device with such a simple screen can be modified this much. The controls, however, are not great and it makes it quite hard to play. There's also some serious screen glitching going on. This is not from Doom though. From what I understand, the LCD driver in this iPod can only support four shades of grey, like the Game Boy or the HP 200LX. But the Rockbox team found a way to get considerably more shades of grey. The CPU in this iPod is a PP5002, described as a digital media management system on a chip. It has dual ARM processors running at up to 90 megahertz each. And the CPU includes an LCD interface. It must be something to do with the way this chip drives the LCD that they took advantage of to get the extra shades of gray on the screen. This technique can also be seen when playing MPEG video files. It looks like there's a layer of snow or noise constantly over the image, but there's definitely more shades of gray in this image and I find this absolutely amazing. I would love to know more about how they did this. Fortunately, Rockbox is open source and there's a whole forum to explore. Rockbox opens up so many possibilities and I can't believe I haven't tried this before. I'm gonna to have to find some more music players to try this on. Maybe something a bit more modern with a USB port, maybe even a color screen. Let me know if you run Rockbox and what you think of it. And what player do you use? I know which music player I want to get next to try it on, but there doesn't seem to be any on eBay. That's always annoying. A vintage piece of technology, but you just can't find it anywhere. Thank you to my supporters who've been lending me stuff. I really appreciate it. If you enjoy these videos, then consider one day helping with a membership or other form of donation to help the channel. That's optional though. I'm going to keep making videos anyway. Most of all, 
I really appreciate sharing these videos with you, reading your comments, or just knowing that you're enjoying them. But that's it for now, and I'll see you next time.